Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's big video which features a 1965 to 66 Gibson GA5T amplifier in absolutely remarkable uh, original condition. I took this and its big brother, a GA15, in and trade thinking that they would make a good subject matter uh, for videos. So let's see if I was right. Okay, let's start off by taking a real close look at this and I think you'll see why I feel it's as nice uh, an old uh, GA5T as you will ever see. Okay, let's get started. First off, the control panel is immaculate. It's a little dull for my taste and I think could uh, benefit from uh, some car wax. Uh, we see over here the instead of the toggle switch they have a rotary switch for on off with the pilot light. Okay, we do have tremolo. That's what the T is in GA5T. So we have a depth and frequency, tremolo control, and loudness, and then uh, tone controls with two inputs. We'll see if they are of equal impedance. Next is the grill cloth, which is bright, sparkly, and in absolutely flawless condition. Looking up here on top, that really coarse type of uh, covering material that Gibson used. It's sort of a basket weave, uh, highly uh, embossed pattern, and really neat and distinctive for the mid to late 60s Gibson amps. It's in really great shape, but if we look hard, there's some little white specks here and there in it so we know that it's lit. then we move here to the handle which may at first glance appear to be original because the rivets are in place on the straps but uh, I had already replaced this handle for the customer that I took this amp and trade from I didn't make a video of it but I have made a video of the procedure uh, previously uh, let's review it real quickly instead of drilling out or uh, digging out these rivets you drill the center pins here that go through and hold the strap and remove them then insert your new strap and then put in new pins uh, and I epoxy them in shape when I do that to be sure that uh, they'll stay so you have a, a much cleaner look here without uh, screws instead of rivets okay and I thought it suited the uh, design and color of the top. I hope you agree. The sides of the cabinet are equally flawless. I think you can see why I sort of fell in love with this when I worked on it previously uh, for the handle and some other uh, minor changes. Uh, due to the condition, it is just like new. And to reinforce that, let's turn it around and take a look at the back which as you can see is up to the lofty standards of the front and top. We have really nice clean Skylark back panel here with the all-important Underwriter Laboratory sticker. 1.5 nice conservative uh, amp fuse and uh, both lower and upper back panels in place. Let's uh, pull out the cord and also a nice pleasant surprise is it has the foot switch. Let's uh, pull these back panels and take a look at the interior. As you can see the interior of the upper rear panel is in perfect shape as is the original foot switch for the tremolo. A little bit of uh, looks like tape residue right there. Not sure why it's there. And I had already replaced the power cord for the customer uh, with a three-wire cord. We'll look inside to sort of review how that was done. Now, one thing about this that at first kind of uh, worried me a little is that the speaker has been replaced. Speaker, it is an Alnico speaker, uh, which is in, uh, to its credit. Uh, but we'll have to take a closer look at it and see if it's up to our standards. Also, uh, we see the tubes up in the roof with no rectifier, so uh, we can assume that this circuit has some sort of solid state rectification. The tube complement is on the positive side as far as I'm concerned with two 6BQ5s. Uh, there's a 6C4 as a uh, second preamp tube and a 6EU7 uh, 
uh, as the first preamp tube and as the tremolo oscillator, which may leave you uh, wondering where the heck is the phase inverter? Well, this particular circuit uses this little transformer back here as an interstage phase inversion transformer, which is rather unusual. Okay, uh, this circuit uh, on the whole is, is rather unusual, and I think uh, when we review it on the schematic, you'll find some things in it that will be very interesting. This larger transformer, of course, is the output transformer, and then a relatively good-sized power transformer. They didn't skimp on this, okay? The materials on these uh, mid-60s Gibson amps are always of fairly high quality, okay? The, the downfall of them is they generally sound terrible. They just have a hideous, uh, strident, thin, uh, really unpleasant uh, tone, almost like fingernails on a blackboard. Okay, much has been said about that, even in some of my videos, but uh, we'll address that when the time comes. So now, without further ado, let's extract the chassis from the cabinet and take a look at it, and then we'll do a schematic review to see what it is that we're looking at. In the past, I have squawked about difficult methods to remove chassis, and this one is the worst, I think. There's four of these inverted Phillips head screws that go up here through the wood uh, cleat and into the chassis, and boy are they no fun to get to. It's sort of like an upside down fender arrangement but with the screw heads inside the cabinet. Okay, not a good setup. But in Gibson's typical uh, spare no expense and attention to detail, they're black enameled screws which are just beautiful, guaranteed not to rust, and you can tell by the condition of the heads they're like the 90 year old widow. They haven't been out much. Well, the chassis screws may be a mess, but the foot switch unplugs from the chassis and the speaker wires have nice little uh, disconnects so that the chassis can be disconnected from the speaker without having to unsolder it. Uh, and there's no strain relief holding the power cord, so the four screws are out. It's time now to slide the chassis back and out of the cabinet. Now with the chassis out, we can see that the speaker is a code 67, which is an eminence speaker. Okay, and an Alnico, a nice replacement. I see no tags on the bottom or underneath the magnet hidden away saying made in China. So although that may be the case, uh, those stickers are not evident. Now the cabinet is surprisingly heavy even without the chassis in place. That's because they didn't skimp at all on this cabinet using three-quarter inch solid pine for all four sides, the floor, and the front baffle. The thinner, probably like three-eighths or so, uh, front, uh, top, and bottom rear panels, though, are in particle board. But I, I think they can be excused for that, uh, considering the quality of the rest of the cabinet construction. And now we have the immaculate chassis out here on the workbench. Uh, the tube sockets were unlabeled and I penciled in the uh, identity of the tubes that fit into those sockets uh, just to help uh, future owners. Um, we have the original, according to the schematic, uh, part numbers here on the power transformer, the output transformer, and that interstage phase inversion transformer. Okay, uh, you can see uh, over here is where the, the foot switch plugs in. Okay, and these are the connections for the speaker terminal. It just couldn't be any neater or cleaner. Now let's flip it over and take a look at what's going on inside. And uh, as no surprise, the circuit is beautifully wired, absolutely neat, top grade components everywhere just as nice as it could possibly be. It appears that the filter capacitors have been replaced because I don't think they were using JJ uh, can caps uh, back in 1965. There are 320s here. The red wires are the 320s. The black then would be the ground for the triple can capacitor. 
this is a nice touch because it's going to save me some time and effort. Okay, let's take a look at this schematic now, uh, and then we'll take a look at the circuit. Uh, we see that there's two inputs, both with 68K grid stoppers. Uh, both inputs pass through a 0.0047 microfarad cap. Then we have a 470K grid leak to ground before we enter the grid of the first triode of a 6EU7 tube. And uh, that 6EU7 is cathode bypassed with a 5 microfarad cap and biased with a 1.5K resistor. Now let's look at the circuit and see how it coincides with the schematic. Okay, here we have the stacked inputs. We see they both pass through the 68K uh, grid stoppers. Here, here is the 0.0047 microfarad cap. And then the signal comes over here to the grid of the first triode of the 6EU7. When we look at the cathode here, which is pin 9, we come back and we see that we have the 5 microfarad bypass cap and underneath there is the 1.5 um, ohm cathode biasing resistor which uh, the tails of both of those come over here to ground. Now back to the schematic uh, when we leave the plate of the 6EU7 first triode there uh, preamp tube uh, we're going to go through a 0.01 microfarad cap over here to the base control then we'll pass on through a 470K resistor and we'll feed into uh, the treble control volume and then finally into the grid of the uh, 6C4 tube. So we'll look at the circuit now. We see pin 7 which is the plate of that 6EU7 comes over here. Here is the 100K uh, resistor which is bringing the B plus to the plate and here is the 0.01 uh, microfarad coupling cap which feeds over here to the base control. The base control then feeds both the treble control and the volume control. And at the volume control the signal is given a choice. You can either come through this wire to the 6C4 tube uh, grid or you can go to ground and that's how volume is controlled. Now the 6C4 is the second stage of preamplification and the plate then will feed the interstage um, phase inversion transformer and through it will provide the signal to the grids of the two 6BQ5 tubes which are arranged in a push-pull push configuration. We also see that those 6BQ5s uh, are cathode biased with a 130 ohm 5 watt resistor and also cathode bypassed with a 20 microfarad uh, capa uh, capacitor. And sure enough, here is pin 5 of the 6C4 and it goes out through the chassis to that small interstage uh, push-pull uh, phase inverter transformer and then the signal returns to our two 6BQ5s. This is one of the returns to the plate of this 6BQ5 and the green wire here is the return to the other 6BQ5 plate. And we see here are two 6BQ5 tubes. Let's see how they're biased. Okay, we see this suspicious yellow wire coming over here to the uh, terminal strip and lo and behold here is our 20 microfarad bypass cap and our 130 ohm biasing resistor both going to ground through this purple wire. If you haven't already guessed, I'm doing this to help people that are trying to learn how to interpret schematics to see a direct comparison between the schematic and the circuit and I hope this is helpful. Now let's come out of the plates of our 6BQ5s here and we'll go into T2 which is the output transformer primary which is center tapped and receives the 
B plus, the high voltage then will come in from our power supply here to those plates and the signal will come out from the plates and create the push-pull output that will cause our secondary winding of our output transformer to drive our speaker and produce our sound. And here, uh, pin 7 of the right 6BQ5, pin 7 of the left, notice the blue wire comes here, the brown wire comes here and goes through to our output transformer which is located on top of the chassis. I should also tell you that blue and brown are very standard colors for these plate wires and that red is a very standard center tap feeder from our B+. Uh, next we'll go through the power supply and we'll see where the B+, that goes to this red center tap, comes from. All right, here's our power transformer. Here's the primary winding, the one that plugs into the wall. We see that we have a neon pilot light which jumps across here. It's a hundred and say 10 or 20 volt neon bulb to show us that the power is on. Um, we have a death capacitor here, 0.022 microfarads between the primary winding and ground. Okay, uh, most people will disconnect that. We'll take a look at it and we'll decide what to do with it. We also have a 1.5 amp fuse here in the hopefully hot wire, but we're not sure because the original plug was an unpolarized uh, two-prong uh, plug. And uh, in this case, I've already installed a three-wire cord. We'll see how that all works out when we see the primary circuit in the amp chassis itself. All right, here's the three-wire power cord. The black hot wire goes first to the fuse and then over here to the on-off switch and then through this black wire into the primary of the power transformer. It also should be noted that that black wire connects to the death capacitor here, 0.022 microfarad, which goes straight to ground. Okay, this is the uh, capacitor that people fear and tend to remove. We'll discuss that in just a second. The other AC input is the white wire, which is the common or return. It comes over here and goes straight into the primary winding of the power transformer through this wire. And last but not least, this is the uh, neon pilot light. One of the wires connects down here to the black wire on the cold side of the on-off switch. The other wire comes over here to the white return uh, wire uh, from the AC uh, input so that when this uh, on-off switch is turned on, current flows through the 100 and 20 volt neon bulb and illuminates it to show us that the primary winding of the uh, power transformer is energized. Next let's pick up with the schematic and the secondary of the power transformer. We see that it is center tapped and that center tap is always grounded. This is the high voltage output winding that's going to produce the B plus for our circuit. We see that this is a rather unusual power transformer in that its output is 255-0-255. Okay, so it's going to be fairly low plate voltage. We see that both ends of the output are run through diodes to rectify it uh, and then passed on over here to a 20 microfarad cap for initial filtration. Also, it runs straight up here to the center tap of the output transformer to feed the plates of the two output tubes. All right, here are the two secondary outputs from the power transformer. These will be the 255 volt, 255 volt outputs. One of them is fed to the what appears to be the tail end of this diode. The other is fed to the tail end of this diode. Okay, so uh, the two diodes then uh, each will be outputting from the striped end 
and this right here will be the rectified high voltage for our circuit at this point. It should also be noted that this is the center tap for the high voltage and it comes over here and through this purple wire goes straight to ground. Now back to our B plus at this node right here we see that it passes through the red wire just as the schematic said and connects down here to a 20 microfarad tap on the CAN capacitor. It also passes through this heat scorched 1K resistor and then uh, appears over here at this node and is again filtered by another 20 microfarad capacitor just like it was in the schematic. And uh, since this is heat scorched we're going to replace this with uh, maybe a higher wattage or metal film resistor. When you see things like this uh, it means that uh, the resistor's value has probably been compromised due to excessive heat. So this then is scheduled for changing. Also before we move on, notice down here is our 6.3 volt heater filament winding. Uh, let's take a look in the circuit and see uh, how it connects to the filaments of each of our tubes. As is typical, uh, the uh, 6.3 volt winding uh, output is a green wire, fairly heavy because we're going to be flowing some current through that. Normally it's tightly twisted. This is not really well twisted. Beginning and end. Okay, um, not the greatest um, twisting job there. I'm sure that uh, Chubby Checker would uh, dislike it intensely. Then we're going to, because these uh, tube filaments are wired in parallel, we'll jump her down the line to each of the tubes and this one down here will jump her down Notice the upper one's white, bottom one's going to jump her down in black. So it's like a ladder with each tube a rung in the ladder with 6.3 volts passing between the uh, white wire and the black wire through its filament. Now our B plus will continue through uh, this resistor right here and be reduced in voltage a bit. Why? Because the plate voltage requirements of the preamp tubes are much lower than the plate voltage requirements of the output tubes. So we'll step it down a bit here with a 3.3K uh, resistor and then feed uh, the B plus to the uh, primary winding of that interstage phase inversion transformer and then onto the plate of the second preamp tube, the 6C4. We will filter it with a 20 microfarad cap and then send it down here through a 100K resistor to the plate of the uh, 6EU7 preamp tube. I believe that this filter capacitor here was put on the schematic by error because there is no nodal resistor between it and this one. And in the circuit there are only three 20 microfarad caps. 2020, 20, not four. So I am going to write this one off as a mistake. Now let's take a look at the tremolo oscillator. We see that it uses the second triode of the 6EU7 preamp tube. It has the very typical oscillation loop uh, where it exits from the plate, it goes through 0.022 microfarads, and then a resistor to ground. 0.022 microfarads, resistor to ground, and then 0.01 microfarad, resistor to ground, and then back into the grid of the 6EU7. Therefore, the output reinforces the input, and that's how you develop the oscillation loop, like a dog chasing its tail in a circle. But we're going to draw some power, some signal, from this loop and we're going to take it off right up here and run it through what amounts to a volume control to control the strength of the signal where we give the uh, signal a choice. It can either go up here to some mysterious place that we'll see in a second or it can go to ground. Now let's see where that mysterious place is and we look up here and our oscillator signal is going to be fed into the center tap 
of the secondary of our uh, phase inversion uh, interstage transformer and be fed to the grids of the two 6BQ5s. Now what do you think a varying signal on the grids of these output tubes is going to do? If you said it's going to change the bias of the tube a whole lot, as it swings positive, the tube output will go up. As it swings negative, it will impede current flow and the uh, signal strength leaving the tubes will go down. And you're going to end up then with a rising, falling, rising volume, output volume, which is the definition of tremolo. We also see down here that by controlling the value of the resistor between the 0.022 and 0.01 microfarad caps, we can control the speed of oscillation. So we run a 100K resistor over here and then we go to 1.5 meg pot and by varying the pot value we can vary the resistance from this point here to ground and therefore change the rate of oscillation through the loop. Okay, and this gives us our speed or frequency control. Now looking at the circuit, things get a little congested in here, but let's hit the high points, okay? Here's the oscillator loop capacitors, the 0 0.02, 0 0.02, and 0 0.01. Uh, we see that the wire comes out here and comes over to the tremolo depth. Uh, we know that that's like a volume control, so let's see what it feeds. We come over here through this yellow wire, and sure enough, it goes to the center tap of that interstage uh, phase inversion transformer that's on the other side of the chassis right there. And then it's going to pass through the green striped wire and the green solid wire right in to the grids of our 6BQ5s, just like the schematic said. As far as the frequency control goes, remember we went through a 100K resistor, it's right down there, and then through the green wire over here to the frequency uh, pot, which then will vary the resistance being applied to that point in the oscillator circuit here's the oscillator circuit, and vary the speed or the rate or frequency of oscillation. Okay, I think that about does it for the uh, circuit and schematic analysis. I'm going to change that uh, 1K resistor that we see here is scorched. Well, despite the heat, the value has held true in that 1K resistor, but I'm still a little nervous about it, so I'm still going to replace it. Well, I just happened to have a stash of high wattage carbon resistors, so I thought, heck, why not put in a nice big honking, what is that, 2 or 3 watt resistor in place of the puny 1 watt. And to keep the PC lynch mob at bay, I disconnected the death cap uh, from the black wire of the AC input. Uh, I left it in place here, but as you can see, it's not connected. Well, here's the old maestro performing the CAT scan. Nothing will escape his sniffer. Right, Jack? Well, we're opening a, a surprise package here from a man named Lewis McKinney. And look what he sent us. A set of brand new router bits, cables, boxes to uh, construct like preamps and all in, a giant sack of guitar strings, all sorts of nuts and bolts. This is uh, resistors, capacitors, tube bases, pots, tubes. Just an absolute treasure trove here of amp-related goodies. Jack is just beside himself. He thinks this is the best thing he's ever seen. Casey, however, just wants something more to eat. So, uh, thanks so much, Lewis. Uh, you're very thoughtful, and you pretty well covered all the bases on the things that we would uh, want or need. So, thanks so much, and uh, let's get back to our video. And also, with respect to tube bias, I found with the original 130-ohm bias resistor, 
that the plate dissipations were slightly above 12 watts for the six BQ5s. So I increased uh, the bias resistor value to uh, around 150 ohms and uh, ended up with these values for uh, plate voltage, plate current, and plate dissipations that are uh, comfortably under the maximum of 12 watts. This uh, was probably necessitated by the increased uh, wall uh, socket voltage that we have now up around 120 volts compared to 110 back when the amp was originally designed. All right, now that the minor circuit work has been done, uh, we need to see how the amp sounds. Now, mid-60s Gibson uh, amps have a reputation for rather weak uh, strident tone, not a lot of bass. Uh, some say that's to clarify the muddy output of humbuckers. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it seems to me like they kind of go overboard on the unmuddying. So uh, let's do a baseline test with humbuckers and see how the amp sounds just as it is. wasn't absolutely terrible but uh, it is a little weak uh, it is a little treble intensive uh, definitely not a tweed basement okay so let's see if we can improve it a little bit with some minor alterations to the circuit and to kind of plot out what those modifications may be let's analyze the circuit just a bit from a tone standpoint okay we have the uh, standard 68k grid stoppers here I see nothing wrong with that but we have a 0.0047 microfarad cap that is filtering all the incoming frequencies. Um, as you know, Fender amps and a lot of other amps don't have a capacitor in this position. So I'm thinking let's remove it. Okay, then we come here uh, with a, a 470K um, grid uh, leak resistor and most uh, of the time we see one megs in this position so I'm going to change this uh, grid leak resistor to a one meg ohm. Next we see that uh, they use a rather puny uh, bypass cap here for the uh, first uh, triode of the uh, 6 EU7 uh, a measly 5 microfarads. Let's uh, up that to the more standard 25 microfarads at 25 volt. And looking in at the circuit, this is the 0 .0047 microfarad cap, the 470K resistor, and the 5 microfarad bypass cap. These are the three parts that will be either uh, changed or removed. I find this base control to be rather complex and in some cases rather strange. All right, let's uh, trace our, our frequencies here as they come through the 0.01 uh, coupling cap and arriving right at this point. Now they have three possible routes. High frequency and upper mid-range can take a shortcut through a 500 picofarad cap and just go zooming right around the base control. Okay, they'll be dealt with over here by the treble control, which is fairly standard. The bass frequencies and lower mid-range, though, are left with these two routes. Uh, first, it uh, is facing a 2 meg ohm pot winding right here, which is rather high resistance, so it will seek an easier path through the 100K resistor that goes to the wiper of the pot. Now, if that wiper delivers the signal right here, you have a resistor and then a capacitor which will form a low pass filter. Now this is what you would expect in a base control. However, once the wiper reaches the 0.01 microfarad cap that's tapped right here into that pot uh, winding, it becomes simply a volume control for the base and lower mid-range frequencies. Now I have a hard time envisioning sometimes how something like this is going to work so I think the best bet is 
to plug in a guitar and strum some chords as we move the bass control from one side to the other and see if it functions properly and uh, gives us a good result. Guitar. I've got the treble at 10, bass at 0. Okay, I'm just going to strum a chord or two and move the bass upward. Listen to this. Ah, oh, that's rich and full bodied, isn't it? Uh, how about, let's go up to one and a half. Oh, big difference. Not. Okay, let's go to three. If anything, it's worse. Four and a half. Suddenly too much bass. Really mushy. Let's go up to six. Even worse. How about eight? No, there's less bass at eight than there was at six. Things are getting clearer. Let's try nine. Actually starting to sound pretty good. And up here at ten. That's probably the best sound of all. But so strange because your maximum bass is down here around mid-range just after the trap door and at zero or one, two, three, or four, it's really just unusable. So let me show you a real quick fix here to convert this wretched, unusable bass control into a really nice, uh, progressive, predictable bass control like you're used to. As Amelia Earhart passes overhead, we look here at the schematic, and I think, as you might predict, I'm just going to remove that C4, the 0.01 microfarad cap that is uh, tapped into the base. And it's easy to find. We just look at the base pot. We look back here at a wire that is connected to that tap on the bottom. I think Amelia's coming back around. And uh, here is that 0.01 cap. And what I did is I lifted this end from ground. Okay, so now let's repeat our experiment and see how it sounds. Okay, now let's try it with a guitar. Uh, I've got the treble at 10, bass at 0 like I did before. If you recall, I think uh, up to about a bass setting of what, 3.5 or 4, it was just intolerable. It was like fingernails on the blackboard. Well, let's see what we got here at 0. Actually, it doesn't sound that bad, I don't think. Let's try two. Getting a little better, a little warmer. How about four? I think the bass just showed up at four. That's more than it was with the capacitor in place at, at ten. Okay, let's jump up to six. Sounds about right to me. Let's go seven and a half. A little more bass, not a whole lot. Now we'll go all the way to ten. I think you'll have to agree with that minor modification, the removal of that one capacitor. It's changed the bass control into a good usable control and also sort of changed the whole nature of the amp. It seems much warmer to me and more pleasant to listen to. Uh, just a whole lot nicer. Okay, so uh, I think it's time to button it up and play a few familiar tunes through it. We'll get Jack and Ollie out here and all set up and we'll see how it sounds. You know, before we do, let's give the tremolo a try and see if it needs a tune-up before we put everything away. Uh, let's crank the depth up to 5 and the frequency will say at 1. Not real strong. Let's try it at 7.
Okay, all you trim hounds. Here goes ten. And let's crank the speed up. We'll go up to like, uh, what is that, six? Well, the tremolo is a little slow to come on. It, uh, up to about five, it's kind of weak, but boy, it makes up for it after that. So uh, I'm real pleased with it. I think I'm going to leave it alone. Uh, and now it's time to button it up. And the amp, too. that's about it on this video uh, featuring the uh, mid-60s Gibson GA5T Skylark amp. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope that the correlation between the schematic and the circuit was helpful to those of you who are trying to learn how to read schematic. And I would like to think that the circuit modifications definitely improved the tone of the amp and turned it uh, from sort of a lightweight into a good sounding solid old vintage amplifier. As usual I want to thank uh, all the Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors who are keeping us uh, on the air and advertising free. I also appreciate those of you who are sending me uh, used gear and also uh, components and parts that you no longer have use for. I guarantee you that I do. So now after our rather lengthy session here with this little amplifier, let's get out and get some more fresh air and go back to the car show uh, located uh, at the War Eagles Air Museum. I sold 57 Chevy. It's hard to tell other than what's written on the fender, but it is supercharged. He drives it like an old granny, though. I guess I don't blame him. How about this? Uh, it looks like a, I'm going to say a 39 Ford. I get a little confused on some of these. Uh, when they change the grills around and all on them. But it looks like it's been shaved here at the front. You know, there's no emblem. There's no central chrome strip. Two strips down the side. American five spokes polished. 
Nice color. Very nice car. They go with the, the two-piece windshield that doesn't have that uh, metal strip in the center. And I really don't care for the uh, windshield wipers being parked down like that. That would have to be distracting. Nice interior. Beautiful interior. They go to tweed now instead of the old vinyl or naga hide or leather interiors. Tweed seems to be in. I guess it's a little less uh, prone to burning or, or making you sweat in the summer. Not a charming thought. Beautiful car. This gorgeous truck belongs to the guy who uh, the party is in his honor. Uh, he had a really uh, popular hot rod shop up in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and uh, for years built all kinds of really high quality cars. And he passed away, so they decided uh, to have the party in his honor. He was have he would have a party like this every year, and everybody would come from all over the state of New Mexico, and even some people from Arizona uh, would attend. And I'm sure they'll be here today. Um, so even though he passed away, who can't let that get in the way of a good party? So we're all gathered in his honor today. That's it, the adult toy factory. Lost Causes, New Mexico. Wow, one of my favorites. Late 40s, early 50s Studebaker truck. I will have to get a better look at it after he parks. Meanwhile, let's take a look at this 33 or 34 Ford, which is absolutely gorgeous. Got the polished salt flat wheels with the knockoffs. And like I said, you can't even calculate how much these things cost. They're horrendously expensive, but worth it. They're gorgeous. Super nice interior. I remember the good old days with Hot Rods. You get a milk crate, you know, and no floorboards. And, uh, go racing off down the street. Nowadays, the interiors rival those of a new Jaguar. Beautiful engine. Back away on this thing, because the lines are just gorgeous. Wow. Well, here's a nice original looking Model A. For, judging from the radiator shell, it's a 31. Um, you know, if he put the hood down, and it weren't for the tires and wheels, this would also look like a restored antique. Uh, he's got the, obviously, the Ford engine. He didn't say Ford on the valve covers. You can tell because the distributor's up at the front instead of at the rear, like in Chevy's. Good-looking five-spoke wheels. Original top height. Hasn't been chopped. Super nice interior. Look at that. I love the color of the seats and the the texture of the leather. Really, really nice. Let's go around back. Now, to me, the old Roach Egg tank does not look so bad if you have fenders because the fenders sort of come down here and kind of mold it all in. Uh, the fact that it's a contrasting color is kind of unusual, but um, I don't know. I can stand it in a full fender car more than I can in a high boy. There you have it. Beautiful. Good lord. Here's another 32. A full fendered three window coupe. Uh, roach egg tank. Not looking bad. Because of the fenders and uh, the shrouds and all that go along the sides. Three window coupes are kind of snazzy. Much less common, I think, than 500. Look at these gorgeous wheels. They're black chromed. Very deep inset. You can tell we're at an airport, can't you? Beautiful leather interior. Good lord. Manual transmission. I believe this was built by um, that friend of mine that had the white high boy. He's one of the few people that. Uh, puts in six speeds. Beautiful interior. 
Great looking engine. Nothing extraordinary, but beautifully done. Look at the overflow tank for the radiator. You get a the old fashioned kind of like a steam uh, engine le uh, a level here for the fluid in the tank. That's really nice. Air conditioner compressor. Let's get a front look on this one. You had it already, huh? Yes. Beautiful. Here's a beautifully done car with a weird stance. Look how high this is in the rear. Now, God knows, it's got like a nine inch Ford with big coilovers, good husky tires and wheels and all, but damn, that's unusual to have them be up so high. Let's go around to the front here. Well, look at this to hold the door part way open. Nice, simple interior. Oh. Three twos, nice engine. I honestly am not thrilled with the stance and the rear fenders, but like I said, my opinion is the only one I have. So I'm sure, you, yours may differ, but it's like they worked so hard and spent so much money to get close, but they didn't quite get over the goal line in all things in my opinion. Well the cars keep arriving. Look at this for a super nice old 44. Let's take a look at this truck. What is this about a 46 or 7 Chevy? Gorgeous bodywork. It's just perfect. Engine nestled down there, nice and cozy. Beautiful bed. It's like a stuck record, nice interior. These guys go nuts. Look at that. Beautiful. Dash. Absolutely first class. You know, everybody spends all their time and money on engines and on wheels and tires. And they're just, when you really go nuts on the dash, it just sort of separates your car from the rest. It's sort of a subtle improvement. Very nice, and now my critique, whether you like it or not, it's way too high off the ground, especially in the front, and it would look a whole lot better, I think, lowered and raked. There, I said it.